am Professor John Jackson, and I will serve as the Master of Ceremonies for this very special session on leadership under extreme pressure. I'm pleased to pass the digital microphone to Rear Admiral Chatfield for her opening remarks. Admiral? Thank you, Professor Jackson. Uh, we're so pleased to welcome back a uh, Naval Aviator and Professor Emeritus of the Naval War College uh, with us this afternoon. Uh, we were so sorry you were canceled last year due to COVID and so grateful uh, that you've come back uh, to be with us again this year. My husband, David Scoville, and I have been so, uh, so inspired uh, by your story, and I've invited him to be here with me today uh, to listen to you speak. Uh, you'll be introduced uh, at length by Professor Jackson, who's known you for such a long period of time. Uh, but I just wanted to express my, my deep admiration and honor to be here uh, and on behalf of the United States Naval War College to welcome you back. Thank you very much, Admiral. Well, I wanna, don't want to take too much time to uh, take away from our speaker. I've been asked to take a few minutes to provide a little information about the events leading up to the capture of Porter Halliburton, to speak briefly about the treatment of POWs in general during the Vietnam War, and then I'll turn our Zoom session over to a man I greatly admire. Please feel free to ask any questions you might have throughout the presentation using the chat function and they'll be addressed after the formal presentation is completed. So first, I'd like to ask each of you to think back to where you were and what you were doing on November 12th, 2013. Let me spark a few memories. A new animated movie had just been released called Frozen, featuring the Oscar-winning song, Let It Go. On TV, the series Homeland and Breaking Bad were all the rage. In New York City, One World Trade Center was dedicated as the tallest building in the United States, taking its place on the site of the buildings destroyed on 9-11-2001. And the Denver, Denver Broncos were preparing to take on the Seattle Seahawks in Super Bowl XLVIII, or 48 for the non-Romans in the audience. I ask you to consider all that has transpired in your life since that date. Well, November 12th, 2013 is exactly 2,675 days ago, which is the period of time that Porter spent in the prisons of North Vietnam, seven years, three months, and 26 days. It's been over five decades, or half a century, sorry, Porter, since Lieutenant Junior Grade Porter Halliburton and his pilot, Lieutenant Commander Stan Olmsted, climbed into their F-4B Phantom fighter bomber and launched on a 17 October 1965 mission over North Vietnam. This was Porter's 75th combat mission of the war and it would prove to be his last. During a low altitude run 40 miles north of Hanoi, the plane encountered heavy ground fire and took a direct hit in the cockpit from a 35 millimeter anti-aircraft shell. Recognizing that the plane had been critically damaged and the pilot killed, Porter ejected, ejected from the stricken aircraft. He was soon captured by Vietnamese villagers, and at the age of 24, he became the 40th American flyer to be taken prisoner in North Vietnam. Since no other aviators on the raid had seen a parachute, it was assumed that there were no survivors and Porter, fought, Porter was classified as killed in action. To help visualize the events and conditions which followed, we will display a series of drawings done by Lieutenant Commander, let me get my uh, slides working, by Lieutenant Commander Mike McGrath, who himself spent six years as a POW in North Vietnam. The stark images that will follow were taken from his book, Prisoner of War, which was originally published in 1975 by the U.S. Naval Institute. Once Porter ejected from his stricken aircraft, he was quickly captured by local peasants and militia. Within days, he had been transported to the Wa Lo prison, 
which ultimately became known as the Hanoi Hilton, and thus began his seven and a half year ordeal. Mike McGrath drew pictures of their accommodations, but more revealing are these photos of the actual cell in which Porter was held. As you can see, the prisoners were kept in very austere conditions, often shackled in leg irons and handcuffs for weeks and months at a time. When they were not locked down, they were subjected to brutal treatment from abusive guards who took great pleasure in their suffering. Most vicious of all were the professional interrogators who were given pet names by the prisoners. With total disregard for the provisions of the Geneva Convention, these interrogators use various forms of punishment and physical torture to force information and statements from the POWs. Many were forced to kneel on rocks and other sharp objects for hours or even days on end. By far the most common method of torture was what the POWs came to call the rope trick. They were tightly bound in painful positions, which often pulled arms out of sockets and left many permanent injuries. Punishment was routinely given for violations of camp rules. This punishment included beatings with rubber straps and painful, countless painful hours in shackles. Communication of any kind between the prisoners was forbidden, but the resourceful POWs maintained contact with one another by various clandestine means, including written notes on scraps of stolen paper, the now famous tap code, and a POW devised mute code, which was used when visual contact could be made. From 1964 through 1969, most prisoners were kept in solitary confinement or in very small groups, but several events, including the attempted rescue raid on the Santé prison, caused a significant improvement in treatment and conditions. Over time, increasing pressure to improve conditions was brought to bear by the U.S. government, as well as by individuals such as H. Ross Perot, and organizations such as the National League of Families of POWs and MIAs in Southeast Asia, which was founded by Sybil Stockdale, the wife of former Naval War College President James Bond Stockdale. Porter's wife, Marty, was a very active member of the National League as the coordinator for the 10 Southern states. Public support was shown in many ways, and many in this audience may have once worn POW bracelets such as shown here. From 1970 on, most prisoners were held in large cells in the Hanoi Hilton, each holding up to 40 prisoners. Their conditions were still meager and crowded, but still far better than they had been before. After over 10 years of war and nearly five years of negotiations, the Paris Peace Accords were signed in January 1973 and the POWs began to be released in February. Shown here, Lieutenant Commander Halliburton is about to board the C-141 in Hanoi on his way to freedom. The remarkable story of Porter and Air Force Colonel Fred Cherry was told in the book, Two Souls Indivisible, the friendship that saved two POWs in Vietnam. We regret to note that in February of 2016, Colonel Cherry passed away. Dr. Halliburton served as a professor at the Naval War College from 1979 until his retirement in 2006. He now holds Professor Emeritus status. I will leave it up to Porter to speak to this final image. And at this point, I'd like to welcome Commander Porter Halliburton back to the Naval War College. I think you're muted, Porter. Okay, um, thank you uh, for that introduction. I, I wanted to uh, have you show those things since I'm not gonna really talk about uh, uh, some of those uh, during this talk because um, the, um, 
The gravestone that you saw there was because I was uh, declared killed in action for about a year and a half before uh, anyone knew that I was alive and there. And so uh, my family had a gravestone uh, placed in the family plot. And uh, I discovered that uh, when I came back home and uh, the uh, funeral director asked me what I wanted to do with it. And I said, well, I hadn't really thought about that a lot, but uh, anyway, I had the Navy move it up to our home, new home in Atlanta. And uh, so that gravestone has moved around quite a lot. And the, the uh, aside from being a, a quite a conversation piece, if the conversation uh, dies down during a cocktail party, we can always go out and look at the tombstone. But the great thing about it is to be able to look down upon it instead of up. And so uh, I am so grateful for uh, the many, many years I have had since that date in 1965. And I asked John to show some of these slides uh, just to uh, set the stage of what the environment was like for us, what we were dealing with. And uh, it really shows that brutality and boredom were two of the very central features of our captivity. However, they were certainly not the most important. Uh, the most important, I think, were how we reacted to these conditions and these um, events while we were there. How did we use these in order to survive. And so this is really what I want to talk to you um, this afternoon about. And I want to divide this up into um, the various aspects of my captivity, and there are several different forms of, of that. I want to divide it into threes. Uh, there are three, roughly three time periods. There were roughly three adaptations to different times and conditions. I have three reflections about all of that. And in conclusion, uh, three important things that I would want to pass along to anyone. Three things that are still uh, very much uh, important in my life today. So the three time periods, the first one would be from 1964, when Everett Alvarez was shot down in August um, at the beginning of the bombing of uh, North Vietnam. And of course he was there by himself for uh, quite a few months, nine months, I think. And this period ended in uh, the summer of 1966. And during this time, uh, torture was not routinely used. It was used as a punishment. Um, the conditions were certainly brutal because they were so different than what we had been used to. You know, when I punched out of that airplane, I was, I was cutting an umbilical cord that connected me to the carrier. And uh, life was quite different after that. It was during this time that um, we were introduced, or I was introduced to three of the great leaders that we had there, and I got to actually speak with all three of them. Uh, Jim Stockdale, uh, Robbie Rosner, and Jerry Denton. There were certainly other great, great leaders from top to bottom, but these three stood out for me because I, either talked to them or tapped with them uh, at the very, very beginning of my uh, captivity. And it was during this time that we learned how important it was to establish uh, lines of communication because it doesn't do you any good to have great leaders if they cannot connect with or communicate with you and you cannot connect with them. And so communication, we we figured out right away uh, was going to be an essential feature of our existence. And so 
like in the Navy, you know, we say you have to get there early to get the good deals. And so sometimes it's hard to figure out what the good deals were. But And I was number 40 to be captured. And so we were just a few of us there. Uh, but the good deal was that uh, the three, three, at least these three great leaders were shot down early as well. And they were there assessing the situation, passing along guidance uh, when when we could uh, communicate with them and so on. So the first lines of communication, the tap code, uh, talking, various other note drops and so on, were established during this period. And for us, it was a period of adaptation to uh, a, a uh, environment that was entirely different than anything we had really been prepared for, even though we had been through SEER school. SEER school taught some important things, but they also taught some very unfortunate things as well. So uh, after about 10 days of inter constant interrogation, I was living in that little cell that you saw spending many hours a day in interrogation, doing my best to stick to the code of conduct, giving name, rank, service number, and date of birth. And that was working because I could withstand all the threats, all the beatings, all the intimidations, uh, the leg irons and everything else. Uh, and I um, was successful in sticking to the code of conduct and uh, one day the interrogator said, uh, you know, if you continue to refuse to talk to us, we're going to send you to a worse place. And uh, of course, I couldn't imagine a worse place than that little cell in uh, the cell block in the Hanoi Hilton. And the, that cell block was called Heartbreak Hotel. Um, but if you do talk to us, we'll send you to a better place. You'll be with your friends. You'll have nice food. You play games. You write letters and get packages and all kinds of things like that. And so I had to make a choice. I wasn't sure that they had uh, a better place or that they would, even if I talked to them, that they would um, they would uh, fulfill the promise. But I wasn't going to do that. And so I continued to refuse and sure enough I moved to a worse place. Now I won't go through each one of these um, but uh, there were three more. About every two weeks I was given this choice, better place, worse place. Each time it got harder. Each place was harder in a different way, uh, worse in a different way. And finally, I wound up in, I think, the worst place they had, which was a coal storage shed in a different prison called the zoo. And in this shed, which had been used to store coal, and there was still coal dust everywhere, there were rats, there were, of course, mosquitoes, flies, every kind of vermin you can imagine. And one of the worst parts of it was I was completely cut off from converse, from communication with any other person. I could look through the crack. I can see what it seemed to be normal activity in the rest of the prison, but I couldn't communicate with anybody. I didn't know why I was being treated this way. I didn't know whether everybody else had uh, decided to talk to them and I should or not. It was just a terrible, terrible time. And I was very sick. I couldn't eat any of the food. I was at the end of my rope physically, uh, mentally, and nearly spiritually. And about all I had to do during the day was ask God for strength, courage, and wisdom to get through this. And I wasn't sure that I could get through this. And so saying no one more time was the hardest decision that I've ever made because I didn't think I could survive even the place I was in, much less the worst place. And so late at night, I was handcuffed, blindfolded, taken up to another cell block, and they opened the door, and they pushed me into the room, and they said, you must care for Cherry. And of course, inside was Fred Cherry, 
black Air Force officer, a major 105 pilot, shot down five days after I was, terribly injured. His arm had almost been ripped off of his body. Uh, he had many other injuries as well, could not do very much to him. And uh, we quickly figured out that based upon their stereotypical ideas of uh, white Southerners and uh, black Southerners, that putting me in with a black and telling me to care for him, to wait on him, to do everything for him would be the worst thing they could do for me and would finally break us both down. And of course, uh, that turned out to be the very best thing that they could do. And so that choice there that I made, a very difficult choice, it brought, it, it illustrated to me the importance of the choices that we make. I cannot imagine if I had chosen the other way, what my life would be like now or whether I would have a life now. But that one choice determined the rest of my life. And so I think we realized right then that um, even though we were absolute prisoners of our captors, they could do anything they wanted to with us. They had no constraints. They did not uh, claim to um, abide by international law uh, there. And so they could do anything they wanted to with us, and including kill us and whatever. But the one thing that they could not do was take away our freedom of choice, our free will, God's great gift to us of free will. And so in this way, we were not fully prisoners. We were control, in control of our life. And throughout our captivity, this became uh, so clear to us that this was, this was the most important thing that we could do was to exercise our free will, make choices, very difficult choices sometimes. And so we learned that during that time. I also uh, got to know uh, some of the other leaders. Uh, they were all senior officers. And I'll tell you one story about a, a wonderful man that was, uh, he was an Air Force captain. His name was Bob Purcell. And uh, I heard this story about him uh, and it was so inspirational to me uh, that it, it it proved to me, you know, that the great leaders are not all senior and they um, it's not just what they say, but what they do. And so Percy was living in a in a building uh, that had been turned from three rooms into 10. And so in each uh, above each cell, they had dropped an electrical line down so they could put a, a, a low watt bulb in there so they could look in at night and see what you were doing. And they had gotten up in the overhead through a hole, hole in the ceiling and, and Bob Purcell, Percy was, was in that room and he heard through the tap, taps down the hallway um, that there were several Americans down there being starved and denied water as a method of coercion. And so they quite often tried new things. And this was the first time that we heard that they were using starvation and thirst uh, as coercive uh, methods. And so Percy, um, to make a long story short, he figured out how to get up into that ceiling, in the hole in that ceiling, and he went down uh, the overhead, and he got above uh, the cell of a guy named Norlin Daughtry. And Norlin had two arms were broken, one in two places, the other in three. So he's completely helpless, and they are trying to starve him, which was inspirational in itself. And yet Percy went down there, and he's looking down the hole, and he sees Norlin uh, down there, and he said, hey, Norlin. Well, Norlin had been praying a lot, like a lot of us, 
And uh, he must have thought God was talking to him, but Percy said, no, it's me up here. And uh, so we told him a couple of jokes trying to cheer him up. But what he really did was he took his own food, rice, and what little solid food, and he made it into pellets in balls. And he took that down there and he dropped it down through the hole for Norlin. He also took his water pitcher and he poured water down for Norlin. He kept Norlin Daughtry alive and two other men on his own food for two weeks. And he survived on just the liquid from the soup. And you have to understand every time he got out of his cell through that overhead hole in the ceiling, that the Vietnamese would consider that to be a escape attempt and they kill people for that. And so he was risking his life every day. He was giving up all of his food, uh, but he kept these guys alive and the, the Vietnamese couldn't understand how they were surviving. And they gave up on that program. And so Percy's act, and this is just an example, his act demonstrated a number of things. One is that, you know, this Americans are so tough that they can survive without any food. And so, you know, that's not going to work. So to my knowledge, they really didn't use that method again. And uh, you can tell how much uh, it affected me uh, not knowing Percy at the time, I was very fortunate to to live with Percy um, quite a lot, and he was a wonderful, wonderful leader. But stories like this began uh, during this early period and were so inspirational about what they did. And so it was so clear, even though we got words of uh, uh, of advice, guidance, a few rules from our senior leadership, you know, it was what people did, and it was what Stockdale did, and Reisner did, and Jerry Denton did, that really made uh, the difference. And so I think that was an important lesson that we that we learned there. Well, um, the next period began in the uh, in the summer of 1966, and <clears throat> it began because we chose to bomb Hanoi for the first time. And we bombed their POL storage uh, in Hanoi and Haiphong and completely wiped it out over a couple of days. And so the Vietnamese decided they were going to take it out on us and that they were going to make an example of us. They threatened to put us on trial for war crimes and execute us. And this all was launched by what you might have heard of as the Hanoi March, in which we were marched down through the streets of Hanoi, uh, two by two, handcuffed together. And it was one of only two times where I feared for my life uh, while I was a prisoner was in, I thought we were going to be slaughtered in the streets of Hanoi. Um, President Johnson did say that if they tried to put us on trial or execute anybody, that he was going to use the B-52s to level Hanoi. And so they did not put us on trial, but it did usher in the most brutal period of our, of our time there, which lasted from 1966 to late 1969. So it was not only the most brutal, it was the longest. And they decided that they wanted to, they were going to get what they wanted uh, from us uh, uh, by extreme violence. Uh, they had not been able to generally get what they wanted by any other means. Uh, and we learned what, what their overall war strategy was. They knew that they were not going to defeat us militarily. They knew that they had a great deal more patience than we did. They knew that we responded to public pressure. And so their objective was to convince the American people that this war was either unwinnable, was immoral, was illegal, uh, it was too costly, uh, too many people were dying, we, we weren't going to win it, and would have to um, withdraw because of 
lack of public support. That was their overall strategy, I believe. And actually, it was successful. So um, the, um, the time that we were together during this time was uh, a time of great suffering. And we found that that suffering brought us together. Common suffering brings people together in a way that nothing else does. And so um, it, was a, it was a very, very difficult period. And uh, we got through it though. We learned some very important lessons uh, during that, that time. At the end of that, um, Ho Chi Minh died in 1969, late 1969. And I think that they, uh, they reassessed uh, their success, what little there was, and found that they didn't have very much, that they found that we had, um, we had developed what we call second line of resistance. And that means that when we discovered under extreme torture that we all of us had a limit. At some point you had to say, I will do something. What it was, uh, was a different matter. And so once you said, I give, uh, then you started thinking, well, how am I going to resist? How am I going to deny them what they want? And so we assessed our strengths and our weaknesses. We found that one of the, um, the great strengths that we had and the weakness that the Vietnamese had was that they were uh, largely ignorant of a lot of American humor, uh, customs, history even. They had no one who was educated in the United States, no one who spoke American, a couple of Several of the interrogators spoke excellent English, but it was not American English. And so we could use their ignorance um, to send signals to uh, a knowing audience that this was being coerced, this was not true, whatever. And so we used uh, this second line of resistance as a form of resistance. So I think that they, um, at some point, probably uh, some Chinese or Russian was there and they saw that most of the pictures that they had taken of us included uh, at, at least one of these, sometimes two, and, uh, and they explained to the Vietnamese what it meant. And so they realized that we had been pulling, pulling a trick on them. And so they realized that what they had been doing was not terribly successful. And it was beginning to turn uh, American public opinion against them. Even the anti-war uh, section of, of American public opinion. And during this time, you know, Ross Perot had been flying plane loads of gifts over there, which they refused. Um, they wouldn't allow the Red Cross in. Uh, the National League of Families um, had been formed by Civil Stockdale. My wife, Marty, uh, was very, very active in that once she found out that I was alive, which was about 18, uh, 18 months uh, after uh, she thought I was dead. Uh, there were uh, thousands, thousands, perhaps millions of uh, POW bracelets being worn, it was all kinds of pressure being placed on the Vietnamese to treat us better, not necessarily to turn us loose, but to treat us in accordance with the Geneva Convention. And so um, they decided uh, Ho Chi Minh's death provided them with a, um, a, a time to do that. And so things got a lot better. We began to get packages, letters, uh, food improved. We, uh, uh, I got my first, uh, my first letter uh, from Marty and first packages and so on. And so uh, it was a very, very different time. The groups got larger uh, for a variety of reasons. And so I was, I spent a long time 
in a, a group of uh, nine of us. And uh, some of the things that we could do uh, in a group of nine, as opposed to living with just one other person, was uh, quite, quite different. And I can talk a little bit about some of that. Um, I know that uh, we could do serious um, um, educational activities. We had classes. We engaged in um, serious um, uh, athletics in a way in our own um, limited space and so on. I learned to walk on my hands. I did, a, you know, I did 6,000 deep knee bends without stopping. We had a little contest. Um, we learned to do all kinds of things we never thought that we could. And so um, the, uh, we also learned uh, the art of storytelling, movie telling. And, uh, and so during this time, uh, there, our environment was quite different. Our health improved, our weight increased. Uh, the Vietnamese were deliberately trying to, to uh, fatten us up, uh, get our health better. We got vitamins and so on from home in packages and so on. And so these were the three different periods and they were all, they were quite different. And um, so I had uh, adaptations to each of these periods. And what I'm going to describe now doesn't necessarily uh, coincide with these, these chronological periods, but roughly they do. And I call these three adaptations, the first one is retrospection. And it was because we didn't think that uh, the war was going to last very long. I, everybody was optimistic. The most pessimistic person that I ever talked to during this period thought that we might be there for two years. And uh, everybody else thought it would be much less. And so what we did uh, was quite different during this time. Uh, I need, uh, let me read. Uh, one of the things that I did throughout the time I was there was to write poetry and stories and songs and things like that. And so let me let me read uh, the first the first poem that I wrote. And it was very early in this time when we thought that uh, we would not be there very long. And it's called Winter Crypt. How can I describe the way that I feel? as if the stream I was crossing had suddenly frozen and locked my ankles in an icy grip, immobilizing that once fluid force and I with it. And we have nothing to do but wait until the thaw. Well, we certainly um, found out that we had a lot more to do than wait until the thaw, um, but that would come. And during this period, though, when uh, we were just trying to hang on, survive, do our duty, uh, and all of that, um, we, I lived in the past a great deal of the time. I relived my life. Uh, I thought about um, <laughs> everything I had eaten, all the girls I had uh, dated, about everything in the past. And mostly the good things, because that took me out of a very unpleasant present. But in the course of it, of course, I began to realize that my life had a lot of flaws. I'd made a lot of mistakes. I'd done things that were wrong, things that I needed to atone for. And so it was a period of, of thinking about the past intensely I spent I could spend days thinking about um, could I identify everybody in my first grade class and so having a, a lot of time means that you could spend a lot of time on a, such a project and you were living in the past while you were doing it so sometime I have felt I had relived my life to the extent that I could and I began to regret those mistakes that I had made. I began to think, well, how will I um, make up for this lost time? 
I began to think about the future. And so I was really living in the future, building my obligatory house, you know, board by board by nail, uh, doing all of these things in preparation for my release because nothing really mattered all that much beyond survival and doing my duty and release. And so I lived in this, I lived in the future because it was a way of escaping from a very unpleasant present. During that time, I began to, to live with other people and to uh, learn things from other people. And I began to think about how my life was going to be in the future. And so I began to categorize all of my interests and I uh, put them into an alphabetical list. And I began art, aviation, automobiles, and so on, right on through the alphabet. And by the time um, I, I got through with that list, I had 77 different categories of interest. And uh, of course, I hadn't consult consulted my wife or family at all about any of this. And so a lot of it went out the window as soon as I went home. But it was during this time that I thinking about the future in order to escape from the past or the present. And then at some point, I realized well, once we had gotten together in, in bigger groups, we had educational things, we had recreational things, we were I had a, a day, every day was planned out, you know, and I, I, I realized that um, I had to stay busy the whole time. I had to keep my mind busy and so on. And so I realized that actually um, we had adapted to this environment, that we had almost everything that American society would have except for our real families. But we had we had grown into a not only a military organization, we had senior officers, we had um, a structure, we had all kinds of things in that regard. But we also were a family and we loved each other. We cared for each other. You know, we people did things like Percy did looking after e each other. We wanted to make sure nobody fell through the crack uh, in any way. And so there were incredible things that were done. And in the process, you become a family. And we developed a culture, mid 60s culture. Uh, and uh, suddenly realized that I was no longer living in the past. I was not living in the future. I was living in the present because we had adapted to our conditions that we had made the best of it. And so towards the end of that, um, I think we found that we could lead a meaningful life just where we were. Not that it was the life that we chose, but it was the life that we built. And so in contrast to when I was first shot down, I thought I would love to be home. I was shot down in October. I'd love to be home by Christmas. <laughs> um, and then when I wasn't, I said, I can't imagine being here during the summertime, but I was. And so gradually uh, we adapted to longer and longer uh, projected release dates. And uh, I will say by the end, I was mentally, physically, spiritually prepared to stay there another 10 years if I had to, or the rest of my life, and still believe that I had a meaningful life. So this was, um, you know, the, these were three periods that uh, that were distinct in a way. And uh, during that, you know, let me read uh, another poem that was written later that um, perhaps uh, shows a difference in um, difference in attitude than from the first one. And this one is called "Reflections on Captivity." How can I measure the loss of my dimensions as I lie spread across this crass expanse of time, bitter years, 
devoid of latitude or luster. My duty days of trial and decision are but pages turned, but pages not forgotten. Those countless hours of aimless retrospection, regret, restraint, and introspection, the strange monotony of unrewarded, unrewarded hopes, unconquered hopes amidst my unborn tears have tempered the metal of my structure and filled the empty spaces of my soul. So I want to talk a little bit about three reflections that I have on this experience. And um, these are things that still guide my own life today. And that's why I, I single them out, why I think they're important uh, things that I learned. And the first is that uh, for me anyway, I need to lead a balanced life. I did there, I, I determined uh, fairly early that I needed to stay active. We heard stories about prisoners in Korea who died, not necessarily because of the harsh conditions, although the conditions there were certainly in many ways worse than they were in uh, Vietnam. It was because they gave up. They had no hope. They had no proper training. And so the code of conduct is actually a result of the failure of uh, POWs in many ways in Korea. Because they were not properly trained, they were not, they were not the sort of homogeneous group that we were in Vietnam. They did not have effective leadership. And so I was determined that I was going to stay as active as I possibly could every day, mentally, spiritually, and physically. And so I tried to divide my day up into those three activities and recreation as well, part of uh, mental uh, activity. To try and learn something new every day, to try and establish uh, uh, a connection with with God, and to keep my body as as healthy as I possibly could. As I mentioned before, the other uh, thing that I we realized was that the choices we make determine the course of our lives. You know, someone said, you know, that in in life's terrible arithmetic, we are the sum of the choices we make. And I think that's very true, that there are things that we cannot do anything about. And so we shouldn't spend a whole lot of time worrying about them. But there are things that we can do something about. And sometimes we don't realize that we can do something about them. And the fact that some people feel that they have no choice is a, a terrible, terrible loss. And so I think back, you know, in um, making that choice about the better place, the worst place. And I think all the other choices that we were forced to make there, how important they were and the choices that I've made uh, since then. I'll tell you another another story to illustrate um, that. Um, I lived with a wonderful group of, of eight other people. The fact that there were nine of us there uh, became important in this particular story. I mean, we were very active. Uh, we were a, a quite a quite a diverse group, but still homogeneous. All of us. Uh, about the same age, about the same rank, either um, Air Force or, or Navy. And uh, we got along really well. And so um, at some point, uh, people wanted to play cards. And so we decided that we would, um, we would sacrifice some of our precious um, toilet paper, which was like... Um, 
brown brown paper towels. This is a, a, a prime selection of very high quality Vietnamese toilet paper. And so we we tore them up into little sections about like that. Uh, we used brick dust and cigarette ashes and pig fat and uh, marked the cards. We took us a while, but we got a deck of cards. And so people use them for a variety of things, but people wanted to play, most people wanted to play bridge. I was the only one who knew how to play bridge. And so um, uh, there was one guy who did not want to play bridge. And so that was crucial to this story. And uh, so I taught everybody all the conventions that I knew. Uh, and so we got, so everybody, you know, could play a fair hand of bridge. And we had a special hiding place for these cards because of course this is against the camp regulations. And uh, so we, we knew when the guards were coming around, we made sure they were hidden. So on, but one day uh, the guards uh, came into the room quicker than we could get the cards hidden, and so they discovered them. They called the they called the interrogators down there and the guards and everything, and of course they were quite upset that we had violated the camp regulations and so on. So they took the cards and they they ripped them up and they. They threw them in the uh, honey bucket and they threw us all in leg irons and so on. Took away most of the stuff that we had. And as they walked out the door, they said, you are forbidden to play cards. And so they slammed the door and here we are sitting around in leg irons and Somebody, might have been me, might have been somebody else, said, let's play cards without the cards. And so this scheme evolved. And the fact that we had uh, eight people who wanted to play, uh, there's one who didn't. The one who didn't then became the dealer. And he had to divide the cards uh, up into piles of 13. And once he memorized those, we couldn't write anything down, obviously. Uh, he had to teach each pile to uh, four, four guys who were became the hand. So once they had memorized the 13 cards that they had, they consulted with the players, the four players, and they taught them the cards that they had. So the players then could bid based on all this information. And you can imagine it took quite a while just to get to the point where you were going to, going to bid. But we did, we played bridge without the cards and it gave us something to do when we had nothing else to do. We were still in leg irons and sitting there um, feeling a little sorry for ourselves at first, but we soon realized that we made it, we had made a choice about how to react to this situation. And that that choice was very important. It not only gave us something to do, it was a great act of defiance. You know, they can tell us we can't play bridge, that we can't play cards, but we are going to do it anyway. And so this idea of choosing, exercising that right to choose and, and doing so wisely, we all need advice how to make the best choices, of course. Well, the third reflection is that I think we all, or most of us, realize that we were searching for some meaning in our life. You know, we can, we're just, prisoners there sitting there doing nothing, that we had to have some meaning in our lives. And I had not, I had not read uh, Viktor Frankl at the time, but after I came home, somebody gave me a copy of his uh, book called Man's Search for Meaning. And uh, what he said in this book, he was, a, he was a 
He was a prisoner in Auschwitz during World War II. He had survived that um, miraculously, but he had witnessed so much suffering and death. And uh, he had seen so many different ways that people reacted to their environment. And so he was a psychoanalyst by trade and um, thought a lot about um, his environment there as a sort of laboratory and human behavior. And his um, method of treating uh, people after, after he got out of there was called logotherapy. And it was showing a patient that they could they could discover the meaning in their life because he his conclusion was that if you fail to find meaning in your life you turn to other things you turn to pleasure or possessions or power or any number of other things that may or may not lead to a meaningful life but that this failure to discover a meaningful life led, leads to mental problems and dissatisfaction and everything. And what he said there really struck home. And to me, it explained our own behavior, that, that we were looking for a meaningful life, even in this terrible place. And he said, you can, you can discover this meaning, we're not talking about the grand meaning of life in general. We all think about that as well, but he's talking about the main, everyday le meaning. Uh, what do you find meaningful in your life every single day? And so um, uh, I found that um, to be so powerful. He said, you can discover this by uh, uh, doing a deed, uh, by experiencing a value, or by suffering. And he said, by far, the most effective way to discover this is through suffering. And so this, this was our laboratory. And um, so, uh, you know, every day I am still searching for the meaning in my life every single day. So three um, important things. Um, communication has been mentioned several times. I can't overemphasize that. Uh, I think it was the thing that saved us. It was the thing that allowed leadership to happen. It was the thing that allowed us to come together in unity, solidarity with one another. It was the thing that w without it, we would have been lost. Of course, the really tough individuals would have made it on their own. But we all needed each other. We needed inspiration. We needed human connectivity. And that was the thing that the Vietnamese were trying to deprive us of. And they wouldn't, you couldn't even speak out loud in your cell. You, you couldn't make any kind of noise. And so the fact that we did it anyway meant that that was a choice that we made in spite of terrible, terrible punishment for doing that. Fortunately, I never got caught. And I was usually either on the communications team or the head of the communications in every group that I was in. And it meant that I was doing something meaningful in my life every day. And so this TAP code, um, you probably know all about that. Um, I'll tell you um, two things that happened I, after um, after Fred Cherry and I were split up after the Hanoi March and when things really got bad, I moved away from him. I moved out to a very, very primitive and bad prison camp out in the country we call the Briar Patch. And I was in solitary confinement again, and uh, I could only, um, initially, I could only talk, tap on the wall with one, one guy. 
and his name was Howie Dunn. He was a, a Marine Corps major, uh, F-4 pilot. And due to the configuration of the cells, I couldn't talk to the only other person that I would have been physically possible. But I'll tell you first um, that uh, one time, uh, one day, and, and this TAP code becomes like Morse code. You don't think of, you know, three three columns over and two col two rows down. You just you hear you hear these letters appear in your mind after a period of time. And so um when uh Howie and I were top tapping, I, I were handcuffed behind our back all day. Uh, I had to tap with the very end of my finger very lightly on the wall and how he had to have a cup up against the wall like a, a, a like a um, well you know so he could hear through the cup anyway it was very very quiet because we the punishment there was so so terrible and one day I started hearing a message and I had no idea where it was coming from at first. And I suddenly realized that there was a prisoner had been given the job of chopping firewood. There was no electricity out there in this place. And so everything was um, boiled. You know, the water was boiled, the soup was cooked uh, with wood. And, and they had these little homemade machetes and he had been given one of these and so he's chopping on the on the log, and he must have said, "If you can tap on the wall, you can chop on the log." And so he made this decision, and it changed our whole communication uh, network because now we suddenly realized that calling this a tap code was, uh, in a way, a mistake because. You didn't use it just by tapping. You could use it by chopping. You could use it by hoeing. You could use it by any means that you could communicate numbers one to five. And they could be by blinking your eyes. They could be by a facial twitch. They could be by uh, holding up a number of fingers. It could be by tapping your toe where it could be seen by somebody else. It could be by sweeping the street. It, any way that you could learn to transmit numbers one to five, you could communicate. So this, you know, before we just had a person to person like phone line. Now, when you could chop on the log or you could hoe in the garden, uh, it was like having a loudspeaker where everybody could hear. And so later on, we were able to use this. You could use it uh, throughout the camp. You could play 20 questions with people and so on. I won't go into all of that. But I want to tell you um, a story about Howie uh, being the only person that I could uh, communicate with uh, we became pretty good friends. I mean, we we had gone through this terrible, terrible time where we had to um, choose how to react to um, extreme, extreme violence. And we shared all of our reactions uh, with each other. Uh, I looked to him for guidance. He was my senior officer by two ranks. Uh, we became great friends and we began to share our lives, uh, talking about our families and military experience and our likes and dislikes and so on. And then finally, uh, we decided uh, that we needed something more to do. And so we came up with this scheme that uh, on one day, uh, Howie would have to come up with the menu for the day, the the virtual um, uh, menu for each meal and it would tap this across. This is what we're having for breakfast. This is what we're going to have for lunch and so on. The next day it would be my turn. And so during the night when there was no light, nothing, you're just lying there on your bunk, 
uh, with nothing to do, it gave you something to do to come up with a, a, a creative menu. And so we tortured ourselves that way. But in the course of all this, you know, we became really great friends. It occurred to me one day, I'd never seen him. We never got outside together, of course, and I, the, the shutters were mostly closed at all times. And uh, so I said, Howie, I, I, I have never seen you. What do you look like anyway? So he taps back, he says, uh, you know uh, John Wayne? I said, yes, I know John Wayne. He said, well, a lot like that. So I took this image, you know, this guy's 6'2", he's got broad shoulders, narrow hips, rugged, good looks and everything. Um, and I put that uh, mental image with everything else I knew about how he done. And I carried that with me. We eventually uh, moved away from each other. I never saw him again. I never knew, we, we didn't have many Marines. And so I never knew anybody that knew him and so on. And so I, I told lots of stories about Howie. And, um, but I never knew anybody that knew him. And at the very end, when uh, the peace agreements had been signed and uh, that we knew we were going home, they were letting out. Uh, we were, you know, there were 40 or more of us in a big cell and in the big area of the Hanoi Hilton. And they let, uh, for the first time, they let two cells out together. So there were about 80 people out there in this big courtyard. And uh, people I had lived with, people I certainly knew by sight and all of this, and we're having a great time visiting with each other. And this guy comes up to me and, and he, was, he was short and he was bald and not, not really all that good looking. And he stuck out his hand and he said, hi, I'm Howie Dunn. I said, Howie, you son of a, you lied to me. <laughs> and he laughed and we both laughed and he said, I know, but it was such fun knowing the image that you had of me all that time. And so I, I loved Howie. I, I loved, you know, that, that experience that we had, he, he had helped me get through that. And I love this story, but the reason I tell it is to, to demonstrate that you can become, you can do incredible things with very primitive communication. With numbers one to five, I became best friends with this wonderful person. And we saved each other's good sense. We, we saved each other. We became brothers. Numbers one to five. And so today, you know, we have more ways of communicating you can shake a stick at, probably more ways than we need. And yet the crux of it is effective communication. And so that's why I, I think communication is so important today. And there are so many barriers to effective communication. The other thing I think we learned uh, was humor. And uh, there were many instances of that. I had, uh, I had, I lived with a guy from Louisiana. Um, his name was Glenn Daigle, but we all called him the coon ass because he was a coon ass, which is some kind of special uh, Cajun, um, quite a character. And he, he always was coming out with these funny sayings. And I, and I know that, Sometimes when things really got difficult and we were all kind of down in the dumps, he would say, just remember, it's always darkest right before it's totally black. And so that would kind of remind us, you know, that <laughs> they, you know, things can get worse. And so uh, uh, don't, don't worry about it too much. And um, my favorite story about the power of humor is about a guy named Mike Christian. He was um, Herb Williams, um, BN and A6, uh, former enlisted, uh, kind of rough around the edges. And uh, he, he disliked the Vietnamese a great deal. He let them know 
know that. I tended to be more of a uh, a diplomat. I didn't want to ne unnecessarily uh, bring uh, greater hardship upon myself or anybody else. But he let them know how much he hated them. And he uh, always wound up with the crummy little deals if there were unpleasant things to do and so on. And I remember one time he was taken out for some reason and uh, they, they, uh, they wrapped him up. We could hear him screaming and so on. And uh, you saw the graphic images that Mike, uh, Mike McGrath drew of the method of torture that we call the rope trick. And so we knew they were using the rope trick or, or some other method of torture. And so he was gone for quite a while and finally they brought him back and they stuck him back in the room. And uh, we were pretty despondent. I mean, uh, this, you know, this was bad. We gathered around him and I remember somebody, somebody said, Mike, what happened? Where you been? And I'll never forget, he, he got a slight grin on his face and he looked up at us and he said, I, I got tied up and couldn't get away. That little bit of humor changed everything. It, it, it sent us so many messages, you know, don't feel sorry for yourself. I'm not feeling sorry for myself. So you shouldn't feel sorry for yourself either. It's over, I'm back, we're gonna press on, we're thinking about the future, not the past. So Mike's little bit of humor there, conscious humor, he used that to change things. And I could see how effective humor was in leadership situations. A lot of times, you know, things got so bad that you just had to laugh at your laugh at your circumstances. You know, how could anything get any worse? So if you if you can laugh at yourself and laugh at things, to use that as a leadership tool, humor can change everything. So the final thing uh, that I learned, you know, I learned this, the first lesson that I think is the most important about making choices. I learned that at the very beginning when I chose uh, the worst place and moved in with Fred Cherry. The second most important lesson that I learned, I did not learn until the very end. We were sitting around waiting to go home. We knew that we had, you know, they, they had the civilian clothes. We had a shave and a haircut. Uh, we knew we were going home soon. I had my, uh, my list of 77 things, you know, memorized. I was thinking about, you know, what it's going to be like to be back with my family. And I overheard... I overheard two guys next to me talking about what they were going to do within the first day or so to get back at the Vietnamese, how they were going to get revenge for all the bad that had happened to them. Now, I had built up quite a hatred for the Vietnamese. And I realized that this hatred became an armor it was a defensive mechanism. If I hated them enough, they could not break through that hatred, that armor, and convince me of the justness of their cause or the truth of their statements or anything if I hated them enough. And I did. These guys obviously had hated them as well. But it suddenly occurred to me that hatred uh, was a terrible, terrible force. And that I had already decided when I go home, 
these people are never, ever going to adversely affect my life again. Their punishment is that they have to stay here in this country. And I'm going back to the greatest country in the world has ever seen. That's revenge enough. What I was thinking of was this. This is the first picture that I got in a package after five years of my wife and my daughter, Daphne, who at, in this picture is about four years old or so. This is what I was thinking about when I get home. This is the first thing that I want to do is to be with my wife and my child that I had only seen for five days. And now she was almost eight years old. And so I knew this hatred, I could not take it back. And so when I walked out of the Hanoi Hilton, I thought for the last time, to get on the bus, to go out to the airport, to get on the C-141, to fly to the Philippines and to fly home. I walked through that gate and I turned around and I said to nobody in particular, but to that place, I forgive you. And all of that hatred, all of that armor fell away. And I walked out of there. I walked out of two prisons, the Hanoi Hilton and the prison of hatred. And so ridding myself of hatred at that particular time liberated my life. And I realized that I had to, I had to do away with hatred in my life altogether. My first act of forgiveness was self-preservation, not necessarily a Christian act. Later, I think I, I, I forgave everybody in connection with that war. Only, well, two people I haven't forgiven, but I don't hate them. So, so that was the most liberating thing that I have ever done. And, um, a great lesson. Now, I, uh, I've only read, I want, I've only read um, two poems. I wrote quite a few, but I, uh, I want to end with one more, and it is, I guess, ironically called the Three of Us. Yesterday on meeting you hoping without knowing you, knowing without asking you, loving without telling you. The young and misty two of us, sharing each the best of us, accepting two the worst of us, and we so good for both of us. And as for me, the faulty one, the wild and hungry, needy one, to spend my life in search of one and finding you the perfect one. And so we shared our pastel days, our soft and glowing magic days, and you with child within those days, and then our few but perfect days. Now two of you to wait for me, to love, to hope, to pray for me, and I still feel you part of me, though you and she so far from me. The future still so bright for us, for you, for me, for three of us, and she, the best of each of us, will fill the lives of both of us. And so she has. Thank you. <laughs>